All right. One of the things I would want to maintain is that Christians aren't going to make any headway by trying to split the difference between faith and unbelief. If you have unbelief and faith, yeah. and you split the difference, you just get a muddled form of faith or but a muddled a form of What about this idea of Jesus, uh, Christopher? You don't buy it at all, I take it. Well, I don't think he was the son of God. You don't? No, I don't think his mother, was, think a, I don't think his mother was a virgin, and I don't think he died and was resurrected. Or but it's also died. something that can oh. humble you, if you think about it uh, right. correctly. It, it makes you, it helps put everything in perspective. My name's Kevin. I am the planter and lead pastor of Church at the Well in East Boston. I'm going to give you a few things, kind of what goes on in Boston as we're kind of going through. Um, I, w- I grew up in Bakersfield, and I attended Calvary Bible Church, and I was saved at Stockdale Christian School, which is in Bakersfield. Um, it, it, it's been kind of a wild ride, and it's really cool to be back, so thanks for having me. Um, let me tell you what's happening in Boston. So we planted Church at the Well in East Boston. Um, we've also started three nonprofit coffee houses in downtown Boston, um, and I'll explain why we've done that. We've helped plant a church in Winthrop, Massachusetts, which is right, a neighborhood right outside of Boston, which is an island. We're preparing to train a planter um, to plant in another neighborhood in Boston called Everett. Um, we've just ac- secured a new location for our church and coffee house in East Boston, where the coffee house will it'll be a coffee house basically Monday through. Saturday, and then the church will meet there on Sundays, um, and that will be our fourth coffee house. Um, and so it has been busy eight years. Um, the Lord has really done a mighty work in Boston. And somebody asked me earlier, like, I don't remember why you went to Boston. Like, what was the whole point? And so um, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. That's, that's a horrible question that, that you guys don't know the answer to, but I'm going to give you some quick statistics, because who here has actually been to Boston before? Oh, great, like four of you. Perfect. So um, some of these statistics are a little bit overwhelming, but I am hoping that by sharing this with you that you'll commit to pray for what's going on in that city. Um, So first of all, less than 2% of the city claims to be evangelical. Okay, so if you've grown up kind of in church world, and I don't know what your your story is, um, what that means is if you were literally to take the city of Boston and lift it up off the map and stick it into like missionary statistics, it would fit in what we call the 1040 window. It would be considered a completely unreached people group. Phenomenal. Um, to kind of give legs to that, I guess, this is a statistic that blew my mind. Per capita, there's more Christians in Iraq than Boston. Does that, help? that one helped, right? <laughs> that was better? Okay, good. Um, there's more than 100 universities in Boston, okay? And what's cool about that is obviously it's, a, it's an educational mecca. Um, we're told that 60%, 60% of the world's leaders are educated in Boston, okay? So one of our goals and our hopes is, hey, we're going to meet, you know, if you watch these crazy, I don't know, girls, Hallmark movies, and they always seem to be about princes, and I don't, they, they're from countries I've never heard before. We're hoping that one day we're going to have a conversation with one of these unknown princes, and that he's going to go back home and uh, bring the gospel with him. So that'd be cool. That'd be a cool Hallmark movie. Um, all right. Um, there is one Bible teaching church in Boston for every 42,000 people. 42,000. Okay, so we planted it in a neighborhood called East Boston. There are 70,000 people that live in East Boston. It's a very small neighborhood of Boston. Um, many of you know, like, the neighborhoods or the boroughs of New York. There's five. In, in Boston, there are 22 neighborhoods. East Boston has about 70,000 people, and to date, we are the only English-speaking Bible-teaching church in that entire neighborhood. Um, so it's, it's pretty intense. Last, the last statistic, and this one's not mine. This was actually brought about through people that are much smarter than me. Um, It's not a religious statistic. Basically, they were asking, what are the most influential cities in our country? And if if I said, you know, if I said, hey, throw out some guesses, you're going to come up with things like New York and Washington, D.C., and so on and so forth. But the actual answer to that is Boston and San Francisco. So each coast. They basically say that the direction that those two cities go filters into the middle, and culturally it dictates how we're going as a country. So if you're sitting here and you're wondering, like, man, it seems like the country's changing quite a bit. Like, there's a lot of like, differences in morality. There's all of this stuff. Well, if that statistic is true, and I'm going to trust that it is, then ultimately we need to be reaching cities like Boston and San Francisco for the gospel if we're going to change the rest of the country. Okay? 
So that's why we went to Boston. I answered that question. Um, now, if it's okay with you, I just want to preach. Is that cool? Okay, so turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 4. So last week, Pastor Russ introduced you to a new series, and he just said the title of it, and I don't remember what it was. Thank you. You remembered. Excellent. They do listen. That's awesome. Uh, one person knew it. <laughs> That's so good. Um, the idea of apologetics is this, this concept of saying, okay, this is what truth is, and, and when we study apologetics, it allows us the ability to share that truth in an effective manner. Not only that's true, but it's actually shared in a way that's going to make sense. And so John chapter 4 is a passage of scripture that is really dear to my heart. Um, Jesus is going to have a conversation with a woman at the well. And if you've made the connection at this point, we're called church at the well. There's a conversation with a woman at the well. So everything that we have done in Boston is attributed to us looking at the methods that Jesus used to present his truth to an individual, and we've said, okay, we can kind of grab hold of that. And so what we're looking at, and you're like, what does that do with apologetics? Well, think about it. The world determines what Christianity is based upon what they see. Right? I mean, I make mistakes every day. And I think, oh my goodness, I hope that that doesn't, I hope that an individual isn't looking at my mistake and saying, okay, well, that must be what Christianity is. In a city like Boston, one of the things that we're constantly having to deal with is things like the church, I'm talking about the universal church in the United States, grabbing hold of things that are other than Jesus, like politics, right? And so when the church begins to grab hold of things that aren't Jesus, then those who don't know Christ begin to define the church as that. So we hear things like, oh, you're a Christ follower, so that means like Jesus, you must have been, you must be a Republican and you believe in these things and these types, you follow? That's what they begin to associate with Christianity. So the apologetic of the method by which we live, by which we deliver the gospel, is extremely important. I mean, I have this guy's friend. Well, I'll call him a friend. We disagree on about everything except Jesus. And he go, I call him Bullhorn Man. And he comes into a coffee house. And we have, our first coffee house was in South Station. Okay, if you don't know, not many of you went to Boston. South Station is a train station. So we have a kiosk in there. And this kiosk, this, this, it's kind of like the Grand Central of Boston. 250,000 people a day walk through this building. Okay? So like the quarter of the population of Bakersfield walks through this station every day. That's, that's crazy, right? Totally different world. Um, as, I, as we kind of look at this and we're, we're watching and we're seeing this, this guy, you know, we're, we're attempting to build relationships with people, we're presenting the gospel to people, we're, build, we're, we're trying to get permission to do this. There's this guy that walks in who's called Bullhorn Man, and he literally walks in with his, his sign that says, repent or go to hell, and he begins to scream at people. He's kicked out of the station every day. Every day, security escorts the man out. Every day. It's like clockwork. He came up to me once and he's like, hey, you know, I, I've looked at you guys and I really like what you're doing. And I looked him dead in the face. I'm like, would you please stop what you do? Because you're killing us. Like, people are associating us with you. And I have people come up and we'll start talking about Jesus. And they're like, why is that guy so angry all the time? Does he hate us? They begin to associate. So as we kind of dive into this passage, this is one of the things I'm going to challenge you with. If you're here today and you know Jesus personally, what is it, what is it that is in your life on a regular basis or in the method by which you, do, you attempt to deliver truth to other people that actually misrepresent who Christ is? That's a tough question, right? And it hurts. So how did Jesus do it? John chapter 4, you ready? Let's go. Open your Bibles. If you've got them, I think the verses will be up on the screen. I'm not used to screens behind me. Verse 1, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. 
So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. There are two things here that really, like, get to me. The first one is, it says in this passage that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. I tell people, I'm constantly attempting to help people understand there is a difference between believing something and having a conviction over it. A conviction is a belief that you hold so strongly that it necessitates action. You follow? Meaning, I believe that so much that if I don't act on it, there's going to be a part of me that just dies inside. When we're looking at Jesus' the, the, the narrative here, it says that Jesus had to go to Samaria. It, it, it brings about this idea. There's a conviction in Jesus' heart that says, I have to go to this place. I have to go. I have to. And you're like, well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is if you've grown up in church world at all or you know any Bible history, you know that Samaritans and Jews don't get along. Right? Because we get along with everyone, so we don't understand that fully, right? <laughs> Samaritans and Jews, they had political differences, they had religious differences, they didn't understand each other, they didn't like each other, didn't associate with each other. There's stories in history where Jews needed to get to a place that was up there and they had to, you know, Samaria's in between and uh, I don't really want to go through Samaria, so I'm going to take the long way around. <laughs> and Jesus says, I have to go. I have to. We're on the street. It's a conviction. There's a reason we're called. I have to go there. I have to. Um, I, uh, this was not that long ago. I was on the subway in Boston. We call the subway the T, okay? So don't go to the, go to the bus and call it the subway. I've just educated you. Call it the T. And I'm sitting in the, on the T, and there's nobody else but me and this woman. This woman across from me is crying. And I'm sitting there going, okay. Really? Holy Spirit, you want me to talk to this person? There's some problems with this. I'm looking at my watch. I'm like, hey, I'm late for my meeting, which I usually am already. I don't want to be late for this. In fact, Lord, you're the one that set this meeting up. It's, it's very important. So I, the time's not really working out. I've only got two stops to go. I get to the next stop, and I remember actually praying, like, okay, Lord, look, if, if nobody gets on the train at this stop, then I'll talk to her. And nobody got on the train, right? <laughs> I'm like, like, what are the odds of that in Boston? And then I remember looking at this woman, I'm thinking, okay, I'm a guy, she's a woman, she's crying. I'm thinking about all the stuff that's going on in culture. I'm not necessarily a small guy. This is going to be really an awkward moment, me walking up to her, sitting down next to her and saying, hey, are you okay? So I'm coming with all these excuses. My stop's coming up, it gets to the next stop, the door's open and I step off. The doors close. The train starts to pull away. And this overwhelming feeling of regret and, I'll just say the Greek, the stupidity hit me. And I just fell on my knees and I begged the Lord, Lord, please forgive me. Now, I know God's sovereign, so I know somebody's going to get a chance to talk to her. But it's not going to be me. What I realized in that moment is that the, the, the conviction that Jesus had here to go to this specific place I didn't have. Now, I have it. I moved to Boston. I care about the people. I want to present Jesus to them. I want them to get saved. I want to make disciples. All of these things. But in, there's these moments in my life where I'll put my preferences and my ideas and my schedule above his. And in that moment, I can honestly say, I'm sinning. Because the conviction has left me. Jesus didn't have that. So I have to go. There's, a, there's an appointment here. There's, there's something I have to do in this place. The other thing that hit me in this beginning passage is the importance of the well. Now, maybe you've made the connection at this point, right? We're called church at the well. The well's in the story. Is it coming together? Cool. So what's, going, what's the importance of the well? The well. The well was like the Mecca. Think of it, so they didn't have social media, right? So it was like Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, all rolled up in one, but it was actually face-to-face, -face, right? And so why? Because the well was a natural place that people had to go. You had to have water. You had to. And it was the only place to get it, so we'd go to the well. In the Old Testament, when the prophets would stand up and say, thus says the Lord, and they were speaking God's word, typically that was at the well. Why? Because there were people there. They had to go get water. So Jesus is like, well, I'm cruising into town. 
Where do I want to go? Where are people going to be? Guess what? At the place that people are naturally drawing to, the well. So we find Jesus roll into town, sit down at the well, and he's sitting there. Somebody's going to come to him. One of the reasons that we opened coffee houses in Boston is because as we were in Bakersfield thinking about what are the natural wells in a city? What is it that people have to have, right? We came up with two things. Coffee houses and bars. <laughs> um, I didn't necessarily want to go into the bar business. Um, I felt like it would be counterproductive. So we decided, look, if, what if, what if, this is a dreaming stage, what if we opened coffee houses in the city that actually drew people to us? Well, what if those What if the staff of those coffee houses were actually on mission? What if they were missionaries? And what if their job was to build relationships with individuals that were coming into them and then eventually hoping, as they learn their story and make it personal, get to a point where they can present the gospel to these individuals? And then what if Monday or sorry, Monday through Saturday, those coffee houses were functioning, and then we were able to have a conversation with the person, hey, This is who Jesus is. And by the way, this coffee house that you're coming to every single day is the same place that the church meets. What would happen? I mean, Jesus is having a conversation in a place that wasn't necessarily created by the church. It was created by a need, the culture, a natural well. And as I began to study this, I thought, wow, this is... There's something here. We get people from all over the country that come to Boston, and they're trying to look at our model, and they're like, where did you get this? And I'm like, what do you mean? Jesus did it. It's not mine. I can't take credit for it. I'd love to, but it's not my model. Jesus did it. So we have this conviction of Jesus to go to this place, and the first place that he goes is where the people are, the well. Next, verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For disciples, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink for me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I love this. She is actually acknowledging the barriers that exist between them. Right? She's going, look, I don't understand. You're a dude. You're not supposed to talk to me in this culture. We're at the well. We're different politically. We're different countries. We're different. This, none of this works for me. And her immediate response to him saying, hey, could I have a drink of water, is, why are you talking to me? <laughs> I have come across, so we have a very interesting congregation in our church. So we have, we're, we're not very big. So a mega church in Boston, I know the largest church I can possibly think of, there aren't any, and so we're talking about the town, the city of Boston, not in the suburbs. A mega church would be maybe 300. That would be a mega church. There's a lot of reasons for that. One is there's no space, right? So we have, we're, you know, we're about 125, give or take. But in that 125, we have about 25 different countries represented. We have more interracial marriages than not. And if you don't think that presents some challenges, you're crazy, right? I mean, we're talking, I mean, we are literally just a group of messed up people from all over the place trying to figure this out, um, which is awesome, right? I love it. I love it. Um, but typically what we'll see is there's responses like this. Like, we'll have conversations in the coffee house, and they look at me. I remember there was this, there was this group there last week. These, these teenagers came and decided they wanted to serve in the coffee house from South Carolina or North Carolina, one of the Carolinas, and they were serving the coffee house, and she was terrified to talk to someone, right? And what I kept telling them is, look, it's really easy to start conversations with people in Boston. Just expect the answer to be real. Like here, I go, hey, how are you, how are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm great. Okay, we're off, right? There in Boston, you go, hey, how's your day going? They say, I have had the worst blankety-blank day I've ever had in my life. And you're like, whoa. And we even get to like, hey, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a pastor. No, can I cuss here? (laughs) It's happened. I remember I, I did that in my church, and then the next week I almost did it again, and I'm like, I can't do it. I did that last week. 
um, it's real, right? It's just, it's real. Um, so I get this. There's, there's kind of these natural, like we, like we say, okay, East Boston is 60% Spanish speaking. I don't speak Spanish. But when I say it's Spanish speaking, that's a whole lot of different people. There's Colombians and Brazilians and El Salvadorians and all of these cultures that are kind of mishing together, and they don't even talk to each other, right? And so to get a group of individuals to say, okay, we as the church are attempting to break all of these cultural barriers and all of these other barriers and try to unite these individuals together can be difficult. Just like this woman. Why are you even talking to me? So this girl, I finished the story. I say, okay, you want to have a conversation with someone, so let's walk up. And I, t- I put her in the most awkward situation. I feel bad for doing it, but it worked. Praise God. So I grabbed her, and I walked over to this lady, and it's this, this, this lady standing there, and she is like, I can already tell she's going to be a personality. She's like, give me my coffee, right? Like, she's Boston. And, and here comes this little southern girl walking up to her. And I looked at the lady, and I said, this girl wants to have a conversation with you. And she goes, what do you want to say? <laughs> and so the, 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 the 14-year-old walks up and shakes her hand, and she's like, hey, I'm this person. And, and, so, and then they ended up having a 15-minute conversation. But it's the exact same thing, right? Oftentimes what we have to do is get past what we fear are prejudices, right? Every person in this room is prejudiced towards something. Every person. We have to identify what those are. And then we have to fight it, right? Now here's the thing. I think this is like, ah, let's keep going. Sorry. All right. I would preach for like four hours if you guys would let me. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus goes all spiritual on her. Now, this is something that we attempt to do, right? Like I say this all the time. If you're not living on an agenda, something's wrong, right? Because we have an agenda. What's the agenda? Jesus. You have an agenda. If, you may have forgotten your agenda, but you are supposed to have one. So that means that every conversation that we have is a potential opportunity to introduce somebody to Jesus. Let me say that again. Every conversation that we have, hold on, every conversation that we have is a potential opportunity to talk about Jesus. Okay? We just forget. Now, here's the thing. You're not Jesus, and I'm not. Praise God. Right? Now, Jesus has some advantages over us. He actually can see people's hearts. He created the whole world thing. He knows everything. He's sovereign. Cool. So he's actually able to go spiritual on her immediately. For us, this could take a long time. Right? Like, typically, the way that we'll start a conversation, if somebody's going to sit down with coffee, and I'll, I'll say, hey, tell me your story, right? Because I want to, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to make this personal. I want to know who you are. Who are you? And, and what we train our people to, look, where they start their story is actually even important. What they focus on. Because they're always going to say, well, what do, you, what do you mean? What do you want me to say? I don't know. It's just a question. Answer it. And then they'll start talking and talking and talking, and we start learning who they are. And as we're learning that process, what we're trying to do is, I'm really actually listening to you, right, for you husbands. I'm listening, and I'm paying attention, and I'm knowing what my agenda is, that eventually I want this to lead into a gospel conversation because I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know Jesus, and if I'm listening to their story, then I'm going to know exactly how to apply the gospel to their specific situation. So let me give you an example, because Jesus gives us one, I'll give you another. My wife. Okay, um, I, I didn't ask if I could tell the story, but I'm going to. So my wife grew up in a home where she had issue, father issues. Okay, I'm not going to get into the details of it. But if I was going to have a conversation with somebody like my wife, who, as I'm listening to her story, I'm finding this theme of, man, my father kind of abandoned me. I don't feel loved by him. He sold me out for some artwork, which actually happened. What, what component of the gospel is going to be most meaningful to her? Do you know what it would be? In Christ, you have a father that will never abandon you. 
He will never leave you. He will never disappoint you. He will always be there for you. He's sovereign. He cares. He loves you. And we've just made it personal to them. Now, though that may take us some time, I mean, I have a friend who I've been preaching the gospel to now for eight years. I've baptized two of his daughters. He still doesn't get it. I'm still waiting. I've, I know everything about his story. He's, I, sometimes it takes a long time, right? Jesus is Jesus. He can go spiritual immediately. He's like, hey, I'm going to turn this conversation right now. I know your heart. If you, if you knew who I was, you're asking the wrong question. You wouldn't be asking why I'm talking to you. You wouldn't be focusing on the barriers. You'd be focusing on the barriers that I can remove. Right? Verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Every single cup of coffee that we send out the door has this verse on it. Now, it's very small. We have people that have been coming to our coffee house now for years and I'll be serving them coffee, and they're like, man, I just noticed this verse. What is this? Or they might not even know it's a verse. What is this? Who's John? Right? Like, wow, that's here, softball from the Lord. Hit this. Right? I can answer this question. Low hanging, this is as low as hanging fruit as it gets. One of the things I told, you know, I, I probably neglected to say is our, one of our desires was not to go into Boston to open Christian coffee houses. There are two reasons for that. One, it's a stupid, stupid business model. Who goes to Christian coffee houses? Christians. There's only 2% of the population in Boston who are Christians. We're going to be out of business quick. Okay. Second, since Christians are attracted to Christian coffee houses, then it makes more sense to actually create a well that people want to come to. Right? Right? So if you were to walk into our coffee house, it's going to feel like a Starbucks, but there's little things that will hopefully have conversation starters, right? Jesus starts the conversation. He, he, he tells her truth. He begins to weave this into a gospel conversation. He's taking her everyday activity. I've come to a place that I do every single day, a well, because I have to come here. And he's saying, I'm going to, I'm going to show you how you can use this thing that you do in your life as an example for something much bigger. So he uses this analogy of water. Hey, you're asking why I'm talking to you, but what I'm telling you is this thing that you do every day, I can give you something so much better than this. Now, that becomes a, lot, a shock for a lot of people when we say we have something better for you than coffee, right? But it's real. Um, verses 1 through 14, I, I think the thing that hit me so hard here is Jesus breaks about every cultural barrier that we see. I mean, think about it. He's in a different country, right? Samaria, Jew. There's political issues here. There's gender issues, sociological issues, economic issues. But he finds this thing that is common to everyone. Right? So, something I tell our people all the time, the gospel is the greatest equalizer that will ever exist on the planet. Because it doesn't matter where you come from or what color you are or how much money you have or what you've done. It puts everybody in the exact same spot. What is that? Dirty, rotten sinner. So, you know, I stand here before you a dirty, rotten sinner saved by grace. Right? In fact, Every single person who has ever given their life to Jesus has come to this same spot. It's a realization of your depravity. It's a realization that you actually need a Savior, right? It's a realization to say, wow, I'm not really as good as I think that I am. Because I tend to compare myself to other people that are worse than me, so I feel better, right? <laughs> but when I compare myself to Jesus, who is perfect, I'm a mess. Right? The problem is we compare ourselves to the wrong person. So it requires every single individual 
who's ever going to place their faith and trust in Jesus to come to the exact same point. Dirty, rotten, sinner in need of a Savior. And then here's the beauty of it. It's the same Savior. Same problem, same solution, no matter where you are on the planet. It's why a place like Church at the Well that has so much diversity, it's what allows us to come together, right? Because we can set everything else aside and say, we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, period. And so we gather together and we encourage each other and we build each other up, even in our differences. Because we all know, dirty, rotten sinner, Jesus is Savior. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, and you're like, what's first step? That's it. You have to come in contact with your own depravity. You have to come to a point in your life where you go, I've tried everything and it hasn't worked. Jesus breaks all of these barriers. He overlooks them all. His conviction is, all I see is a person that I care about that doesn't know me, and they need to. He breaks through all of the stuff that we put up. And if I were to stop right there and say, okay, we're done, which we're not, say, what are, these, what are the barriers that you put up in this area? Who are you prejudiced against? Where do you put your preferences above the gospel? Let me ask you this question. Who are you not willing to talk to? And that hurts, Right? Our job as disciples is to break those barriers. If you really want to take a look at evangelism, this methodology of evangelism, our job is to remove every single barrier we possibly can so that it's just them, me, and Jesus in the center. That's what Jesus does. Next, he's going to break through relational barriers. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. I mean, let's be honest with her. We're going to give her a little bit of a break. She doesn't understand Okay. And she goes immediately back to what she knows. He's like, I'm going to give you something different. But she's like, wait, you're telling me that you can give me water that's going to keep me from having to come back to this well? That's awesome. That's like new technology. What is that? Like, Because I, I, I'm tired of carrying these buckets. I'm tired of having to come to the well. So you can give me water that I don't have to come get? Great. What is it? Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. See, we're like squirmy now. The woman answered, I have no husband. So that's an out that Jesus doesn't buy. He says, Jesus says to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. So what you've said is true. He makes it personal. Right? Now, okay, right. once again, you're not Jesus, I'm not Jesus. I don't necessarily recommend this method on first conversation. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> wisdom and discernment comes from the Lord as well, right? So we're not bullhorn man, right? We may know the issues. We may have this with wisdom and discernment. Go, I know exactly what the issues are. From, for, for Christy, I'm not picking on her. She's just there, and I don't know you, right? I know that the issues were father issues. I know that, but that may not be where I can go to right away. It may not be, hey, you know what your real problem is? You are just not forgiving your dad. That might be, uh, okay, we're done. But Jesus can see her heart. He knows what to say. Here's the thing. When, when he's making it personal, since we're not Jesus, I'm kind of give you some practical things. As we're listening to people's stories, and we're listening to who they are, and we're trying to discern what's going on in their life, what we're trying to look at is what are the idols in their life? What are the things, what are the barriers personally that are keeping them from truth? Okay? And so we have to identify those things so that we can present the gospel that's going to make sense to them. The gospel, it doesn't change, but there's components of that gospel that are going to make more sense. Like I gave the example of Christy. And so we're talking, we're listening. What Jesus is thinking, I'm not going to tell you what Jesus is thinking, but it's obvious. He's going, okay, this woman, because I can decipher that she's been with so many men, and she's been married this many times, and she's currently with somebody she's not married to, that one of her major issues in life is she's finding her significance in a relationship. And that's a problem. That's an idol. Because that's something that's being put ahead of our creator. Right? We're not to find our, our significance in anything but him. 
And anything that we attempt to find our significance in besides him is going to completely fail us and destroy us. And it's exactly what's happened to her. Some of you in here are probably in this position. You're like, man, I've tried everything. And I keep trying the same things over and over and over, and they don't work. Do you know why? Because you're not meant to find your significance in anything but Jesus. So Jesus is going, I'm going to acknowledge this. Like, I have something so much better for you, but in order to get there, you've got to get past yourself. You've got to get past this idea that you're going to find significance in a man or in sex or in whatever's going on here and find significance in who I created you to be in your relationship with me. Why? Because it's personal. It's personal. I think one of the things the church does a lousy job of, and I'm talking universal church, is we separate this personal component. We, it's, like, it's like we get in our minds, like the gospel is this thing that's for the collective. Uh, yes and no, right? But it's, it's, it, it's always something personal. You have to get to that point where you go, okay, I'm dirty, rotten savior. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. I need a savior. And then I look at what Jesus did for me, and I go, he died for me. Me. He suffered for me, Kevin. You're like, well, that sounds, re-. no, that's not, <laughs> it, it's personal. It's personal. It has to be. Our relationship with him is personal. I go to churches all over and I see people who claim to be Christ followers and they have no personal relationship with Jesus. They don't talk to him. They don't live for him. They don't do things for him. They don't communicate with him. Nothing. They just show up at church on Sunday. I'm like, it has to be personal and Jesus is making it personal. Here's what you're struggling with and here's the fix for you personally. Next, he breaks, through the, uh, he breaks through the religious barriers. I told this story at the other service, and I've debated whether I was going to tell it to, here or not, but I'm going to tell it. So I told you I went to Stockdale Christian School, and I was, I was this kid, okay? I, my teachers loved me, but I was kind of mischievous. So I got away with everything. And one of the things that... I would do is I was always trying to push my teacher's buttons in ways that, okay, so Bible class, right? I'm like, I remember this. I'm in third grade, and we're studying Noah. Noah, the flood, animals, two by two, ark. Got it? Okay. So she's telling the story of Noah, and I'm like, huh, that sounds really interesting. Um, excuse me, what, what happened to the fish? What, 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 Kevin, what do you want to know? Well, I have a fish at home that breathes fresh water, and I know sharks breathe salt water, so what rained? How'd that work? Shut up, Kevin, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so I'm always asking these questions. This happens all the time. In Boston, this is what this question usually looks like. This is an attempt to kind of sidetrack the conversation, because when it becomes personal, things start to hurt. Like, I tell Christ followers this, the most dangerous prayer you will ever pray in your life is to actually, for the Lord, to remove your heart and literally show it to you, right? Because it hurts. That's painful. Because what we see, we don't like. And so we have these, you know, when things start to get personal and you start talking about something like religion, usually they have something in their back pocket they're going to attempt to sidetrack, right? And in Boston, this is the question always. Really, if there's a God, then why is there so much suffering in the world? Right? Now, hopefully you can answer that question. Can they answer that question? I hope so. If you can't answer that question, he told me in four weeks you will be able to. So there you go. So you need to come back, right? So there you go. We should be able to answer these questions. Jesus, she's going to throw a question out at Jesus that's religious, and what she's hoping is going to happen is he's going to be like most of the church and go, oh, well, we don't, don't I don't know. Right? Now, he's brilliant. You ever think about that? God's brilliant. And he can answer the question. Now, we can't always answer every question, and I hear people say all the time, I don't want to talk to this person because they could ask me a question that I don't know. Well, let's just go with this. You're not going to know. They're always going to have that question, right? I mean, what's worked for me is to, to literally say, you know what? I don't know if I have, well, I don't know if I have an answer to that question. So let, let me show you what it says in the Bible. And the Bible just got opened in the middle of a conversation. So 
Jesus, right, he's, she's going to throw this question out there. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. She's going political. She's going religious. Jesus answered her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is teaching such people to worship him and God in spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And I feel like she was going to go like this. He answered the question. He gave her truth. You know, one of the reasons I th- I'm assuming that Russ is taking you, Pastor Russ is taking you through an apologetics course series is so that you can answer these questions. We need to be able to answer the questions. But Jesus answered the questions. Okay, rabbit trails pushed aside because this is not what's most important. She's just trying to throw something out there. Because it's uncomfortable. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. You ready? Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. He brings her right back to the gospel. Like, you're blown away because I actually created you? And I'm here to save you? And I'm about to die for you? And it's personal? And you're, like, once again, asking the wrong questions? I'm not going to let you sidetrack this. We're moving back to the gospel. Because you're never going to understand it until you understand who I am anyway. This is where I'm at, okay, with this. I have never, ever, 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 ever convinced somebody that Jesus is who he says he is, ever. If you get into that game, you're in trouble. You'll go crazy. I mean, it, if the Holy Spirit doesn't move, it's not happening, right? But I'm not saying give up, but what I am saying is we're not, not dependent upon us. It's dependent upon him, Right? So you're never, ever going to, I mean, I can't imagine, if that were the case, can you imagine, like, showing up in heaven, and Jesus looks at you, and he's like, man, if you would have just given one more analogy, like, eight people would have come to Jesus. <laughs> and I'd be like, like, I preached for two hours, I gave all the analogies, I mean, wouldn't that crush you? It's like, man, just one more conversation, what's wrong with you? And we, we don't have that pressure. Our job is to deliver the message, his job is to save people, Right? So we have to get rid of all of that stuff. It, it, Jesus is breaking the religious barrier. He's showing us, look, the gospel is what's most important. Don't get sidetracked by stuff they can't understand anyway. Let's talk about Jesus. We do this all the time in our own faith. We get sidetracked by things, and the gospel becomes secondary. Don't do that. First things first, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Breaks religious barriers. The last thing is Jesus makes disciples. And I love this. I love this. This is like it, right? 27, verse 27. Just then his disciples came back. They, listen to this. I, I just want to squeeze their necks. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. I mean, to us in this culture, we're like, wait, what? That sounds weird. But they, you want to talk about people that don't get it. And then they say, what? Um, okay, I'm going to read this. They marveled, they marveled that he was talking to a woman, but no one said anything. Why do you seek? Why are you talking to her? They just marveled. Here, here's the thing. They couldn't get past their own barriers. Their job is to break barriers, to eliminate them all, and they're going, wow, we have all of these barriers, and we have no idea why you, the creator of the world, would talk to her. There's too many barriers here, Jesus. Why are you doing that? They marveled. That's a strong word. You pick your word. They were flabbergasted. If I was in Boston, it would be something worse. Like, they marveled. This was... Now, in the meantime, they're off here marveling. Okay? Whatever that looks like for you. So the woman left her water jar and went away into... She left her water jar. She left what she was coming to do every single day. Something's changed. She left her water jar and went away into town and said to people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. As far as I can tell in scripture, this is the first female evangelist in Samaria. And now, I'm going to blow your mind here for a second. Do you realize what she's doing? Breaking barriers? Why? So, I don't know if she was a prostitute. But she was definitely a woman who had some issues. And back then, 
not only is a man not supposed to talk to her, but people wouldn't have talked to her either. And now she, what she's doing is she's breaking all of the barriers that Jesus just broke for her, for other people. She's doing it immediately. Now here's where things get really crazy. She's doing the disciples' job. <laughs> They're sitting over here marveling, remember? And she's like, oh, let's go break some barriers, right? Like she's literally saying, this is who, he, like forget all the barriers. He made it so personal. I'm going to make it personal to you. You have to come see this guy. Pretty cool. Jesus isn't done with the marvelers over here. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Man, these guys are dumb. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is through the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Go, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages, gathering fruit for eternal life, so the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows, another reaps. We set you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into the labor. He's teaching. He's discipling them. He's going, you know, this is ultimately what he's saying. Come on, guys. Like, do you see what I just did? That's what you're supposed to be doing. See the new girl? <laughs> That's what you're supposed to be doing. All the barriers that I just demonstrated to you of breaking so that we could have a gospel conversation, that's what you're supposed to be doing. It has nothing to do with food. My priorities were different. I set my preferences aside because this is the mission. It's to be personal. You get it? It's so cool. Jesus trains his disciples to say, look, Yes, you have to know truth, but how you present that truth and how you treat people or how people are going to define us. So how's it going? Like, let, me, let me get personal for a second. Because I, it doesn't matter. There's, this is, there's enough people in this room that I would say there's probably some tension in here. And if that tension doesn't get dealt with in Christ, it's going to leave this room and you are going to be representing a gospel that isn't true. Ah, right? That hurts. So what gospel do you represent? Jesus is reminding his disciples, who should be doing what she's doing already, that, the, that he's reminding them of the commission that he hasn't given them yet. This is... This, that you are to go and make disciples, right? But a better translation of this is while you are going. Do you know what that means? It means that as disciples, our priorities are supposed to be Jesus. And wherever we find ourselves, at work, at home, in play, whatever it is, we are going. We are on mission. And every conversation is an opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus. Every conversation is an opportunity for us to make it personal. Every opportunity, is an, every conversation, every person we see is an opportunity that Jesus is giving us to make a difference. The difference he makes, we just get to take part in it. How's that going? Like, what's in the way? Like, when you go to your wells in Bakersfield, is that your focus? And you're like, no, I just put my headphones on. Headphones are the enemy of Christianity. I've just come up with that. <laughs> Drives me crazy. You leave your house, you stick your headphones on. What does that say? Don't talk to me. So what do we do with this? I, I really want you guys to grab hold of this, and I want you to understand it. This is why Church at the Well was built the way that it is. Because when we looked at a city like Boston, we went, we have to make relationships with these people. We don't come in there and say, oh, look, we're the heroes. We have the answers. We come in and say, I want to get to know you like Jesus got to know you and make it personal for you because he died for you. I think, I mean, the first question, this first moment of, okay, so what? Like, great story, cool stuff. Like, what do we do with this? The first question is, do you, know, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Now, you're like, well, yeah, I know I've, I've gone to church for a long time, or I know Jesus, or, I, or my grandma's been praying me for years, right? In Boston, that's a huge thing for us. 
People say, oh, I'm good because my grandma who died a long time ago is still up in heaven praying for me, so I'm covered. I'm like, I don't even know what that means, but cool. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? What does a personal relationship look like? I don't know. Who's your best friend? What does it look like? It looks like you spend time with them. It looks like you care about them. I have found in my life that the people I care most about, I spend the most time with and I do the most for. 